National Farmers Organization, the organization that awoke America, presents U.S. Farm Report, a public information program brought to you in the interest of agriculture, rural business, and the well-being of our nation by members of the National Farmers Organization in this area and others interested in having farmers receive cost of production plus a reasonable profit. The National Farmers Organization takes pride in inventing a marketing system to meet the needs of the 20th century, NFO Collective Bargaining for Agriculture. U.S. Farm Report presents W.W. Swain, Public Information Director for the National Farmers Organization, and Arnold Paulson, Granite Falls, Minnesota businessman. It's a pleasure to be here today to visit with you for a little while what's taking place in America. And I have back today a longtime friend of mine, a businessman from Granite Falls, Minnesota, that has appeared on this program with me many times before. And uh, his name, most of you probably already know, is Arnold Paulson, Granite Falls, Minnesota, heads up the industrial promotion uh, uh, industry up there to bring new industry into his community. Arnold, what have you been doing since I last saw you and since we last appeared on the program? Well, Butch, it's been quite a while since we've made a television program together, and uh, I've been busy uh, traveling throughout the country, Butch, lecturing on uh, our fantastic economic problem, <clears throat> and uh, most of the past year, why we've been conducting economic seminars uh, uh, throughout some of the eastern and southern states, uh, all directly re related, of course, to this problem of agriculture. Of course, my theme, which has always been this, that uh, we've got a very serious problem today in agriculture, but we look at it quite differently than most of the experts because we call it a major national economic problem with agriculture as its cause. And uh, uh, we've had some very interesting seminars, and Butch, one thing I'd like to report to you at this time is that I think that the American people are waking up awful fast. and beginning to realize how important agriculture is to our is whole right. national economic problem. But I'd like to ask you a question. Uh, can you ever recall when farm prices have been in balance with the other segments of our economy where we've ever had the need for government programs like we uh, seem to have the need today? Uh, back in the period of 43 to 52 when the farmers were getting uh, uh, practically 100% of parity income. We didn't have need for urban renewal, manpower training, job opportunity, anti-poverty, federal aid to education, or any of these problems. But you see how closely directed these problems are with the decline in farm income? Ever since farm prices started to drop off, why, uh, all of a sudden, these, these problems just mushroom all over the country until today, even the largest industrial cities in America can't even afford to clear their own slums or educate their own children. And this is why, Butch, we maintain that our whole national economic problem today is directly tied to the price that the farmers are receiving for their production. And of course, this is the story that we've been trying to tell uh, people all over the United States in our seminars and in our lectures. And uh, it's a real pleasure to be back with you again because it's been quite some time since we've had this opportunity. What have you been doing, Butch? Well, of course, we've been real busy down there uh, in the research and public information department. Uh, as you know, our organization expanded over much more territory. We're expanded now, clear on over into Maine, Vermont, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, and on into Alabama. And it extends all the way now, Arnold, from, well, from up in, the, in Maine, which is the farthest most state up, clear out across solid in every state. I mean, not every county solid. A couple of three states there have a few more counties that need to expand more, but after you get into western Pennsylvania or about maybe central Pennsylvania, every single county is organized in all the way to Denver, Colorado, and extending on up into Wyoming, up into Idaho, from the Canadian border, down into Alabama, over there in, uh, where Michigan is, and, and on into Georgia and Florida, and everyone down there is uh, worked almost to the point that they can't hardly keep up anymore. Well, most of these states then are all new recently, right? Well, no. Uh, Vermont, uh, Maine, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, and Alabama are new ones. They are? Yes. 
Those are, are new ones. We were in those others before, but we're expanding very rapidly in Florida and Georgia because uh, uh, down there, they're doing a tremendous job of organizing the farmers. I've often wanted to ask you, Butch, how about this television program, these films that you make? Uh, have you, you, you've been adding quite a few new stations, haven't you, throughout the country? Well, uh, we run uh, basically most of the time about 61 television stations, uh, different programs each Sunday that this, uh, this film will appear on. And uh, sometimes in the summertime, we lose a few of these to baseball or football later on in the year. But basically, uh, most of these, the majority of these stations are year-round now. Well, I've noticed, Butch, in my travels now, and I've covered, uh, oh, I think all together about 32 states talking on this farm problem. And I've noticed now in the last year especially that the attitude of people all over the country is changing and that uh, the attitude towards collective bargaining for agriculture mm -hmm. is changing. And you find that more and more people now are beginning to uh, awaken to that one statement that you said that as soon as they understand, they'll all join. Or how was it that slogan went? Well, there's never been any doubt in my mind, but what all farmers will join and support our efforts as soon as they understand our program. Now, all farm groups are talking collective bargaining for agriculture, and even the government is advocating. Uh, just recently, I talked with uh, uh, one of the leading senators in rural America. His top aide there told me that they were coming to the conclusion rapidly in Washington that collective bargaining was the only solution to the farmer's problem. Well, Butch, uh, <clears throat> I'd just like to make a couple of comments on this problem. And you know that I come from a small rural community of about uh, <coughs> 35, 3,700 population. And uh, we're directly related to agriculture, even if we do have considerable industry in our community. But last week, or last Saturday, I believe it was, I made a trip out into Wisconsin for a meeting. And I took my boy with me, and we stopped to uh, drive through the business section of a community about 40 miles from where I live. And the thing that struck us as we drove through this main street is that about one third of all of the business places in that town are now vacant. And not only are they vacant, but the interior of the building is, is actually dirty and shabby. And uh, this is a direct result of the loss of income from agriculture. And uh, this is one of the things that's happening now to businessmen all over the United States, especially in towns under 15 and 20,000 population. Uh, they know something's drastically wrong, and uh, they're beginning to wake up, and now I think they're ready to do something. And uh, i just like to stress this fact, that last year, the agricultural industry, and I'm talking now about farmers, not the agribusiness, just the the, the, the farmers involved mm -hmm. in production were short $48 billion of income that they should have had, had gross, they been, income. gross income had they received their fair share of income like the rest of our national economy. And yet these rural communities, and I'm talking when I mention rural, I'm talking towns of 20,000 population and under, they've got these economic problems. And if this 52 or $48 billion had come to rural America, there isn't a bank in rural America or any community that would be short of funds to finance their, their local economy <coughs> and uh, the prosperity and the economy of all these communities would be thriving the same as they used to back into the, the period of 1943-52. But as a result of this, we're all in trouble, Butch, and we're not going to solve this problem until these communities will run a what we call a, pro, a, a balance of trade, balance of pro, uh, payment survey within their community to find mm -hmm. out where this new wealth originates. And the communities that have done this, there's a rude awakening. And uh, you might say that there's even a fear because a lot of them wonder if it's already too late. Well, I think it's explained very well in this, this paper right here, Senator McGovern from South Dakota that I just received in the mail today, says, although the cost of production in agriculture have skyrocketed, farm prices today are generally lower than they were 20 years ago. The gradual liquidation of farms is inevitable in such a situation, along with the liquidation 
of business, uh, rural towns, schools, and churches. And that's coming right from a man that, that uh, has been in government a long time. And I would also like to read this one that I just received. Uh, this is put out by the USDA. And it says, if farm prices, if farm income doesn't improve, the nation's family farm system will disappear to be replaced by a monopolistic corporate farming operations that could conceivably control food supplies so that they could get any price that they want. Now, who said that? The Secretary of Agriculture of the United States. And I received this in the mail. Uh, it goes out to quite a lot of people. They're trying to do a few things to head this off, and I, I ran across one right here recently, too, Arnold, that's talked about a great deal now. And that is, there's so many people going out of agriculture, the average age of the farmers are getting so old, that now they see that it's necessary to do something so the young fella can get back in. So they're proposing legislation that they would loan the young farmer virtually all the money that he needed and they're proposing 4% interest, and everybody knows that interest is much higher than this, but uh, uh, they're loaning him all the money to try to get him to take over as the older fellow retires, and this would be a long, long time loan. And they're uh, saying that maybe half of this could be paid back in 40 years, and then the balance of it could be refinanced at the end of 40 years. Now, what do you think of that, Arnold? Well, Butch, it just points out the fact that in the future, people won't ever be able to buy and own their own uh, farmland. But I'm... Uh, not at the rate we're going, but it, the, this isn't at, the way it should go. That's right. But at the rate we're going, Butch, what's going to happen is that the people will not be able to own the land at all. Eventually, I see, if we continue to go in the direction we're going, the government will end up owning all of the farmland because of the fantastic cost involved uh, through through the inflationary uh, uh, trends that we're going. But Butch, here's something that's real interesting along that same line. And I'd like to go back to the uh, period of 1950, because uh, right around 1951 is when farm prices started to slide, and of course the farmer's been sliding and you might say bleeding ever since. But I'd like to show the parallel of our fantastic debt wonderland that we're living in and uh, the relationship to the underpayment of agriculture and this is a very uh, interesting chart it's published up in Canada on our own economy and Butch I don't know if you can see this we'll get it in the camera but this shows the debt of the United States prior to World War One and we practically had no debt at all and then during World War One it increased considerably and then after World War I, we liquidated a big share of this debt. Now, the reason we liquidated the debt in this period here is because we went into a depression. And this is when we always liquidate our debt, is when we uh, go through the ringer. And uh, that's when repossessions take place, and the thing that used to be yours or your farm or my business now belongs to somebody else. And then we got involved in World War II, and you can see how that debt continued to increase. But this is the way this debt has been increasing ever since. And just look at this chart as we unfold it. Now, this is only the federal debt. This doesn't include any of the public debt, the state debts, or our uh, local government debts. And here's what's been happening ever since we permitted farm prices to drop below the parity level. And I'm going to give just two short illustrations now, but you can trace this thing out all the way from 1950 up to the present time. The debt in the United States has been increasing at a rate of two to two and a half times faster than the earned income to liquidate the debt. And here's an example, Butch. In 1965, in 1965, the national income for the whole country increased 40.2 billion dollars, but we added 104 billion dollars to the debt, which is over two times the debt in ratio to the increase in income or our ability to pay it. And uh, last year, 1966, the national income increased about 50 billion 900 million dollars, but we added 115 billion dollars to the debt, 
again over twice the ability to repay it. And Butch, here's the thing that scared the life out of me. As I was um, analyzing the statistical abstract of the government of the United States, that the actual assessed valuation of property in the United States, uh, in, in ratio to taxes, that there's only approximately one-fourth of all of the taxable property that's on the tax rolls. In other words, three, over three-fourths of the property in the United States is not taxable because it's being owned by tax-exempt foundations and other groups. And there's even uh, giant food chains in the United States that are owned by non-taxable organizations where they're, they're exempt from paying taxes to support the economy that we're living in. And all of this is directly related to the underpayment of agriculture. We never had these problems at any time when farmers re re were receiving their just share of national income at the marketplace. And this is why I'm so vitally concerned about this farm problem, Butch, not because of farmers or individual farmers alone, but I'm keenly concerned about our private enterprise system the system that built and established the greatest standard of living that any country in the world has ever known. And it's not agriculture that's on trial, but it's our entire private enterprise system. Right. Now, if we're going to destroy private enterprise, we've got to crack the foundation or the base of the private enterprise system. And here's what people don't realize, that today there is still more private enterprise involved in agriculture than all of the other um, uh, segments of our national economy combined. And so if we're going to lose our private enterprise structure, the first thing we've got to do is destroy the family farm. And when the incentive and the opportunity for these millions of farm people who are common people, just like uh, businessmen in my community were common people, when the incentive is gone for us so that we can no longer own our own small business in a rural community, or butch you and others can no longer own your own farm. Then the meaning of private enterprise is completely lost, and then what's the next step? Government takeover, the same as has happened in every other country throughout the world. And this is my main concern today in the program of the National <coughs> Farmers Organization and what you're trying to do. You're trying to preserve that family farm structure, which is the key or the basic foundation of our private enterprise system. And Butch, we don't have too much time left in my estimation. No, and I think that uh, this uh, idea of a loan that would be halfway paid off in 40 years and then the other half renewed again shows how far down the road we are. If farm income is so low that they could only pay half of it off in 40 years' time, everyone knows that something must be wrong. And if we're going to correct this situation, it's going to take cooperation. If the camera would move in over there, we have a picture that, that illustrates this pretty well. Cooperation is the key. And you will note there, you listening audience will note that there's a big steep bank with the farmers up there and a couple of them have already made it up the hill. Uh, in other words, they're in position where they've cooperated together and they've made it to the top. The other or half of the farmers about are struggling to hang on. They're almost to go over the cliff go down and out of business. And while we're talking about that, we've lost one farmer every five minutes around the clock, day and night, seven days a week. For the last uh, seven or eight years, we're losing farmers at the rate of over 2,000 every week are being forced out of business, basically because underpayment to agriculture. And cooperation is the key. The National Farmers Organization, and you'll note that the farmer leaning out over the bank offering a helping hand to the rest of the farmers is labeled NFO. The National Farmers Organization has found the key to success at the marketplace through collective bargaining, whereby the farmers can receive cost of production plus a reasonable profit. And this in turn, Arnold, will save the rural businessman, the independent businessman, and it's cooperation. They're going to leave the camera right on there. It's cooperation that they're going to have to cooperate too with each other and find out as the banker or I mean the uh, the professor Dr. Earl Hetty told him at the bankers convention in Texas last year when somebody pointed out that what he was telling us that rural America must organize he said 
Exactly. He said, you farmers and bankers, if you don't organize together for the good of each other, you're all going to go out of business, and you just as well realize it. I think that's pretty strong language, Arnold. But cooperation is the key. And the farm publication, Farm Tempo, I think in an addition not too long back, we begin to realize this. And they drew on the front page of their publication. NFO has the combination that will work. Cost of production plus a reasonable profit. And the big dial there that you see of the safe, the well-being of all of us, NFO turning the combination that will get the job done. What we need now, Arnold, is more cooperation out of business people, church people, and other farmers. Don't you think this is right? Well, this is true, Butch. Now. Here's, a, here's another illustration that I think should be driven home, is that today, uh, almost every community throughout the entire United States has got a business and an industrial development corporation trying to attract new industry to their community to solve their economic problems. Well, if these communities would only stop for a moment to analyze what caused their problem in the first place, uh, they'd get to the, to the cause of this thing instead of trying to deal with the effects and I wonder how many communities that are listening in today would like to get a $10 million industry for their county that would benefit every community in that county, and they wouldn't have to invest 10 cents because there's no investment required. Uh, there wouldn't have any increase in their taxes. In fact, as a result of this, they'd get a tax cut. They'd get tax relief. Uh, they wouldn't have to add any new uh, public facilities or utilities. Uh, it would bring in increased profits for every business in every community. It would increase the wages and the labor payrolls in all of these communities. And uh, it would bring in more money for their churches. They'd have better schools and a better tax base for their schools. They could improve their hospitals in their community. There wouldn't be any new need whatsoever for federal aid to education or any of these other government programs. And this industry is available to every community in the United States that's in the agricultural areas because what I'm talking about, Butch, is the agricultural industry, and it's merely the shortage of income that this mighty in industry deserves and must have if they're going to have the equity of income to keep these communities alive and growing. And all we have to do is support the farmers in their efforts to obtain fair farm prices, which is based on the cost of operation or in ratio to the wage and interest costs, and every community will directly benefit from it. And this is why I say that we didn't have to have these programs when farm prices were in balance with the rest of the economy. But we're going to have more and more of them. Now, I'm not against government programs entirely, but I think we're barking up the wrong tree. And we're creating the need for programs through the underpayment of agriculture. And if we don't get on the stick as businessmen and uh, leaders in rural America, and I'm talking to the clergy now and to the educators, civic leaders and so forth, and even the laboring people, if we don't get on the stick and begin to understand this economy that we live in and how important agriculture is to the well-being of every person here in the United States, we could, we could stand to lose this private enterprise system of, uh, system of economics that we're living in. And this, Butch, is the one thought that I think we've got to drive home. Because how long can this economy of ours continue to operate on the basis we're going when we don't have the earned income to finance the fantastic increase in the debt. And it's all because of the underpayment of agriculture and the historical records of government will prove it. This is right. The, the debt has fantastically risen, not only the government debt, but everybody's debt. I believe that last year, over half of everything that was purchased in America was purchased on credit, if I recall. And what he's talking about, folks, in a sense, every dollar of gross farm income eventually generates seven dollars of earned national income. And as the farmers lose, everyone loses all along the line. We're losing Main Street businessmen. We're losing churches at a very rapid rate. How many was it that lost out in the state of Kansas alone? One denomination. One denomination alone, Butch, last year closed 250 churches. In the state of in Kansas, the state of Kansas alone. alone, just one denomination. Now, here's the thing. A lot of people realize that we have this problem. 
And of course, the the uh, $64 question is how are we going to solve it or who are we going to let solve it? I think that's even more important than the solution itself is who we're going to permit to solve it. But here in the United States, we've established a system of economics and business which is based on pricing production. And every business segment in the United States that handles a goods or service prices their production. And the same is true with your farm products, Butch. From the time your farm commodities leave the farm in the truck, the trucker prices his services, <clears throat> the manufacturer, the processor, the distributor, wholesaler, jobber, and the retailer. And pricing your production is the American way of doing business. Everybody uses it, our corporations all the way down to the smallest retailer. And the only segment of our economy to today that doesn't price their production is agriculture. And this is why we're in the mess we're in. Everybody's waiting for somebody else to solve their problem for them. And this is the reason why the National Farmers Organization has captured my eye, is because they intend to solve this problem by pricing their production, by farmers organizing, pooling their production, and putting a price on it. And I talked with Mr. Finkston uh, just before we went on the program this evening, and I asked him how long since collective bargaining has been uh, organized in agriculture so they've been in a position to solve this thing if the farmers would cooperate. And he says ever since 1958, the American farmer could have had 100% of parity if they wanted it. And this is true, Butch. They can have it tomorrow morning if they'll just wake up and see the light. Well, the farmers are waking up, Arnold. I'm very happy to report that they're waking up as they've never woke up before. More and more farmers are beginning to be concerned enough to do something about it. And basically, folks, there are just two requirements other than being a farmer. Number one, you have to be sharp enough to see that your industry is in problems. And number two, you have to be a good enough American to do something about it. Good enough American to stand up with your neighbors. Say, this production is mine. I have the legal right under the capper valsad Act to get a price for it, to set this price based on cost of production plus a reasonable profit, and band together as producers and producers only to bring this about. And we can start getting the price tomorrow, Arnold, if enough farmers would wake up. And if you're out there watching, and you've been waiting to see what's going to happen, why wait any longer? With 2,000 farmers being forced out of agriculture every week, why stand back and wait? Are you going to wait until your industry is completely depleted before you work with your neighbor? Or are you going to join with your neighbor now while we have the time, the ability, and the facilities to carry out the program, dispose of any surplus that we overproduce, and get a price for all of it that will keep your son and my son in agriculture and keep private enterprise system in America thriving instead of the way it is today? Thank you. Members of the National Farmers Organization invite you to tune in again next week at the same time for more facts on agriculture and rural America, which is the gear wheel in our economy that produces the majority of our nation's new wealth. Now recognized as the chief spokesman for agriculture, the National Farmers Organization represents new aggressive thinking and a new generation of farmers.